All right, B-listers, you know the drill. This is your official spoiler alert for the episode. If you don't want any spoilers, stop the episode now. And if you don't care about spoilers, hold on to your seats because this episode starts now. Hello, fellow B-listers. Hi. Welcome to the B-Critics Podcast. We're your hosts, Liz and Court. And our guest critic for this episode is Ross. Say hi, Ross. Hi, everybody. Hi, (laughs) Ross. So Ross is one of our friends from college, and he was actually my husband's roommate for most of college, so we know Ross very well. Mm -hmm. Ross also loves movies and always has something great to say, so we're super excited to hear him talk about our movie this week. Ross, do you want to introduce said movie? This week, we are talking about Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider. (laughs) The one and only. That's a different movie, Courtney, The Amazing Spider-Man. That's about 10 years later. Oh, yeah. Well, that one's great, too. This is the OG, like the 2002 version. (laughs) This is seriously the OG, and we're going to get all into it. Um, But first, I'm going to give a description of the movie. In case anyone out there hasn't seen it or for whatever reason in the last 20 years neglected to watch it. Okay, so Spider-Man is the origin story of Peter Parker, played by Tobey Maguire, who gets bit by a radioactive spider and develops arachnid superpowers, such as strength, climbing walls, and shooting webs. Um, Parker faces up against the evil green goblin, Willem Dafoe, who is determined to get to him by hurting the people he loves the most, and also by his best friend Harry, played by James Franco, who tries going steady with Peter's longtime crush from afar, Mary Jane Watson, played by Kirsten Dunst. With great power comes great responsibility. And in this story, Peter Parker faces the challenge of deciding between using his powers to do what's right or what he's always wanted. Was that blurb written in 2002 for this movie? (laughs) Because I don't think anyone... You wrote that? Yeah. (laughs) Do people still say going steady? (laughs) I feel like you're watching this movie. I was in the the 2002 vibe. Okay. I think that's more of a 1962 vibe, but all right. <laughs> okay, whatever. Well, this movie came out in 2002, mm-hmm. and it was directed by Sam Raimi. Um, and it's known for the comic written by Stan Stanley. Um, and honestly, this movie started a Spider-Man sensation. Um, also, according to IMDb, it was a runaway success in the box office. So I think this movie is kind of known for like revitalizing Spider-Man as a comic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this movie was the first movie to be like super, super successful. It's opening weekend. Yeah, it was very, very successful. I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it set an opening weekend record at the box office. Yep. It was the first movie to ever make over $100 million in its opening weekend, and it made just over $39 million on opening day alone, which is pretty incredible. Especially in 2002. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, that's it's crazy. Like, the time frame of that is kind of weird because it was, like, just post 9-11, too. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like people were craving, like, some good – entertainment well i don't know if you guys saw this this may be for later if there's like a fun facts portion but the original trailer for this movie like some of the marketing had him like in nets between the twin towers they had mm-hmm. to like remove stuff about the world trade center from this movie because it came out so close after 9 11 i have heard that yeah. before it's interesting to see that as well that is weird like some of the scenes are very like bad stuff happening in New York City. Like the timing of that is kind of strange. So clearly this movie was successful and people liked Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man, but I'm curious to talk about how we felt about Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. 
Okay, so <laughs> I can tell that both of you know I have thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you. And I think this movie is great, and it did a lot of wonderful things. And looking back on it, having seen the character of Spider-Man be reacted, like be recast several times with Andrew Garfield and with Tom Holland and with uh, Shamik Moore in the Miles Morales movie, like. I just don't think he's that believable as a Spider-Man. He's like such, I just, the movie is so good. And I think Tobey Maguire is like, okay. I completely disagree. I think he is the only good thing about the movie. I like him in it too, honestly. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. I get in fights with the people about this all the time. I'm aware I'm on an island on this, but. I mean, I don't think he's on an island. I think he looks like almost too old to be Spider-Man. Like he Mm -hmm. definitely is. He's supposed to be a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Holland is, like, better as, like, the true believable high school Mm Spider-Man. But I do think he does a good job as, like, going from the nerdy, like, believably nerdy guy in 2002 to, like, the more attractive, muscular man. I mean, yes, he does look like a complete and total dweeb at the beginning of the movie. So the (laughs) idea that, like, he's getting bullied by Joe Manganiello is completely believable. Yes. But... The th- this is the thing that I find stands out. Is, like, I couldn't stop thinking about this last night when I was rewatching the movie. That, like, when he's next to James Franco, who were 27 and 24 when this movie came out. I don't know how old they were when they filmed it. I don't know how long the filming took. James Franco looks so much more believably like an 18-year-old who just graduated mm-hmm. high school. And so does Kirsten Dunst. I did not look up how old she was when this came out. I don't think she looked... I don't think any of them look 18. But I yeah. think James Franco at least looks like 20. And the other two look like they're 28. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, but I do think he does a good job as like the the Spider-Man character. Like I think it's believable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tobey yeah. Maguire actually set the precedent for the nerdy Spider-Man. So like in the comics, he was like kind of the nerdy kid or whatever. But he was not like originally what they wanted to cast as that character. They wanted the like typical superhero guy, chiseled, gen- ch- chiseled chin. Yeah, and not- like... And all that of that was- stuff and he like i think he set the precedent for what spider-man was supposed to be because then later they continued to cast kind of the nerdy type guys versus like the batmans and the supermans of the world i saw this so i saw this interview yesterday that i was watching and he talks about like how he got the role and i guess like the people who were casting were like skeptical about him but the director really wanted him and so he like filmed like an action scene because they knew how he acted, but they weren't sure how it would be in like an action scene. And mm-hmm. I guess he like spent months and months like bulking up for the role. And they put him <laughs> in like this like blue, like spandex, like skin tight suit. And he said in the interview that it like covered up his muscles. So he took down the spandex suit and like wore it around his waist and then like did the fight scene and then got the role. <laughs> that's that's some commitment to the art right there. I'm impressed by that. Using your body to get the job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about some the tradition of- <laughs> as old as time? Yeah. The other characters um, we mentioned, but Kirsten Dunn says MJ. I think she's great. Yeah, I agree. She's I agree fantastic. Too. Her acting is a little questionable, but I feel like they all are kind of acting like that, like very dramatically. I don't know. I think um, that was the point. It's like supposed to be like comic. So Yeah. Yeah. And I like it. I think it works. She does look a little too old to be 18, but I didn't like the red hair. That was not my favorite. Mary Jane, though. That's like an that's like an attribute of MJ, I think. From well, the comics, it, right? That like that specific color just like didn't do it for me. Like they could have toned it down a little. Not the right red. Not the right red. I will say, you're, it doesn't look like the most naturally believable red hair. No. It's probably not, though, right? It's like, not. She oh, it's almost certainly hair. not. Yeah. <laughs> um, but th- in that case, like, you know, you can't just say, like, oh, I don't like her, but it's her natural hair color, so they just sort of let it ride. Like, they chose that <laughs> color. Yeah, they picked it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Okay, what about Harry? But I thought she was great. Yeah, she was great. Um, okay, so James Franco plays Harry, and Willem Dafoe plays 
Harry's dad, Mr. Osborne. Mm-hmm. I feel like they look exactly alike in this movie. Really? Yeah, like believably like father and son. I agree with that. Yeah, I could say that. I guess I didn't really think about while I was watching it, like how believable, but they do. They have like a very as, an, enough similarities mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. compared to like most people in movies who are cast as like father and child. Like they don't go that close, but you know, those two are pretty good. I thought James Franco was underutilized in this film. <laughs> <laughs> I I really liked James Franco in this movie because I think he was really good in it and like when he's just like the sidekick character who like has some quips and like gets to show a little bit of range like i was just watching a movie the other night that he was in where he was like like a it was like part of this we're gonna make james franco like a dramatic leading man thing and it just doesn't like i don't love it when he's like carrying the whole emotion of a movie on his shoulders like i just don't think he's the same he's like not daniel day lewis but when he's just like the teenager who's like mad at his friend in the side of the movie. He's fantastic. Yeah. I thought he was really good. I thought his like like, motions were believable that he was like conflicted between like trying to please his father, but also trying to like be a good friend. Did mm -hmm. a good job. Yeah. It also, but he also has a very tall task of like sharing the screen with Willem Dafoe a lot, who is just, everything he's he's running laps around everyone else in this movie he really is um we'll talk about like a lot of the scenes that he just like dominates but like overall five stars like he was amazing yeah i also really appreciated j jonah jameson jk simmons was fantastic as the editor for the daily bugle he was so good and like, that's, I was going to say, that's one of the things in this movie that's like so clearly just like a ridiculous comic book character. Yeah. It is not believable as a real human, yeah. but like when you give yourself into like, oh, I'm watching a comic book movie and it's just like the most preposterous man who's like, what's that? I don't know. I don't want you. Put it on page six. Yeah. We're selling papers. Put it on page one. I don't care. Like, it's <laughs> fantastic. I yeah, it was so good too. I love like whenever he's in a movie. I think he does his roles so well, and he's so funny about it too. Mm-hmm. Also, did you guys notice like there are a ton of people who are now famous who are in this who had like, like two lines. His assistant was this, it was Elizabeth Banks. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what the hell? What's she doing here? Yeah, looking gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, the the and it was the same thing. The woman like checking people in for the wrestling match was Octavia Spencer. Had one line. I was like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that. I was like, what the hell is this lady doing here? Like, she's so, like, this is all she does. <laughs> she's getting her start. <laughs> so crazy. It kind of just goes to show, like, how big this movie was, I guess, when mm-hmm. it came out, is that there's, like, these big people that are little roles in it. And there was an early performance. I don't know if you guys noticed this. Um, on, like, the bus or, like, no, it was at school. Very early on in the movie, that guy who's, like, the, like, most famous extra who has like that red curly hair who's played like an extra in every high school and college movie for the last 20 years is in a high school in this movie i'm like oh yeah there he is i don't know his name i think he's just cool he never has lines he's just an extra he's just awesome i have no idea what you're talking about but i love it (laughs) no there's gonna be someone who's listening to this who knows exactly what i'm talking about this guy he's like there's like been videos made about it he's like the world's most famous extra because he just look looks like a perfect like weird dweeby kid and he's like in his 40s now and he's still doing it. <laughs> That's so funny. How does that work? Like with him being a high schooler, he just looks like a high schooler. I think pe- some people just have that face. It's baby face. And it's like, like it's like the whole thing because he's got like the afro, right? Mm-hmm. He's got like red. very like high red Curls. afro. He has yep. like some very like nerdy glasses. <laughs> I'm sure they play it up on camera, but yeah. you know. So it's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about is like just the way that this movie captured the feeling of the comic book, but specifically like high school. Like I feel like they did a really good job in this movie of like making you feel like you were in the character's shoes when they're in high school. Yes. And I want to say the 2002 high school, like obviously none of us were in high school in 2002, but we were like alive and we like knew high schoolers. Um, (laughs) Kind of. Here's some Dunce's outfits are very 2002 high school in this movie. I feel like her more than anyone else 
is like exactly got the right vibe for what it's supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I feel I like think- it's like they the way they they portrayed high school when I was like growing up, like watching Disney shows like that. I expected everybody to be mean on the bus, like mm-hmm. everybody mean in the cafeteria. Like they just did it perfect. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, the actual fist fights in the hallway is something that is always in high school movies that like, <laughs> yeah. I just never saw growing up, but oh, that happened at my high school. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I think we had, we had, we did have fights too. Yeah, I take that back. Um, okay, speaking of the fights, like throughout the movie, they had the, like all the sound effects, like the punching sound effects and stuff that mm-hmm. I think made it feel like a comic book too. Did y'all like that? I don't think I noticed it. I think they did like roughly the right amount of it because there's definitely ways to go more and like literally have a thing go pow, which is like really <laughs> takes you out of it. But it's hard to do that like live action. I I noticed it like a lot. Like it was a kind of like like a little bit distracting to me. I didn't. I thought all the fight scenes were fantastic. I'm just learning that Courtney's a much better movie watcher than us. I gotta step my game up or get a better sound system, maybe. I've probably seen this movie like a million times. So I think I was like focusing on the little details like more than I usually do. Yeah. Um speaking of the like fight scene, so right before the first fight scene, like the tray scene where Toby McGuire mm-hmm. like catches like he catches MJ and catches all the stuff that scene they didn't use any CGI he actually caught all of the items on the tray that's so cool how many takes do you think it took he said in an interview is over 150 takes (laughs) there had to be some kind of like string or something involved though right so (laughs) the tray they glued the tray on his hand so Mm -hmm. okay and then I think it was like stop motion and they like would like stop the camera, nobody move, add item, play. Stop the camera, nobody move, add item, play kind of thing. You think they gave him a few attempts to see if he could do it like legitimately the first few times and then we're like, no, we have to do this stop motion. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, because even just like the way he catches, like even if it even if it's glued to his hand and the entire thing is glue, like when the milk falls, like when it hits the tray, it would normally it would fall over unless there's something you know, helping mm. out there. Yeah. I think the reason why they did it and they didn't use CGI was because of the film budget and they wanted to use the budget in other places, but they still wanted to have this scene. So, <laughs> I mean, it looks pretty cool. I love that scene. <laughs> yeah. It is very, it's very early, like him learning to be suave and like talking to this woman he's never spoken to before. <laughs> it's also like the first moment that's like completely out of nowhere and you're like, whoa. He's cool now. What? <laughs> it does feel very much like an 18-year-old who's never been cool picturing what a cool person would do. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not an actual real life move that a cool person would do, but it's like, man, if I ha- was like an athlete, I would just like catch women when they fall and I could just catch <laughs> food on a tray. Oh my god. As far as the thought made it because remember right after he like blank stared at her and she was like, "Okay." <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. He's not actually cool. He just like is trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So before we start going like scene by scene, mm-hmm. I want to talk about like some of the spooky like thriller elements of the movie, and specifically, I want to talk about the director Sam Raimi. Um, so he's known for the Evil Dead movie series, mm-hmm. and. Like, also, most of his movies are horror, like, thriller-type movies. Um, And recently, he actually made, like, one of the Doctor Strange movies. But I think this movie was, like, his first big-budget movie that he got to, like, really explore his creative freedom. And I'm curious to know, like, what y'all think about the elements in this movie that were, like, darker. Like, there was obviously, like, the fun comic book side, but I feel like he got to put in that like darker side and it like really worked so i wish i could take credit for having this idea myself but our uh all of our mutual friend matt actually texted me when i was first talking about this movie and he mentioned to me and i'm sure he mentioned this to you guys too that like one of the reasons the green goblin works uh so well in this movie is that he's just like a horror movie villain being created by someone who knows how to do horror movie villains and there's a moment um 
early on when he's like first starting, I think he's gone out as a Green Goblin like once. And I'm not a huge horror movie guy, but I've seen a handful of them from time to time. And there's a moment where he's like standing in front of a mirror, like, oh my God, what have I done? And his reflection starts talking back to him. And it's like a really perfect encapsulation of like that horror movie element of like your reality starts to change. You don't know what's going on. There's this scary thing. It's not so much like a slasher movie horror element and much more of like a terrifying, you know, kind of like what happens in the Evil Dead movies um, where there's like something that you can't understand that's like talking back to you. And it's um, and it's just like so clear that he's losing his mind. And it's like actually quite scary if you allow yourself to fall into it, which the first time I watched mm-hmm. this movie, I was like, oh, haha, he's just like doing a goof. I didn't really like think about how actually scary it is. And then when you rewatch it um, as an adult who has like seen horror movies, you can see how brilliant it is to like get that moment and show him truly losing his grip with reality and becoming the villain that he becomes with the Green Goblin. Mm-hmm. I wrote down to the whole scene where Spider-Man like goes into the burning building to save the screaming woman and it turns out to be the Green Goblin. Like that's actually scary. Like that scene is like actually pretty spooky. Especially if and, you hadn't seen it before. Like I feel like it would be yeah. like it would throw you so much. I've forgotten how scary some of the scenes are. Like every scene where it's just Spider-Man and the Green Goblin are like actually pretty freaky. <laughs> I thought it worked. I thought the Green Goblin was terrifying. And like when he had his mask on, like how his face would never move. I'd be like, this is freaky as hell. Like he needs to stop. (laughs) It is. I do think that like the design of the Green Goblin is very much drawn for a comic book to like show off how weird and how scary it is. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I don't think actually holds up as well in real life. Like if you were designing that because you were like an actual supervillain. I don't think you would go for like the really elongated head. Like they're like, it seems a little cartoonish yeah. for reality. Whereas like I could totally see on the pages of a comic book, it'd be super interesting. And that's something that I think as like comic book movies have expanded over the last 21 years. I mean, this one and the X-Men movie in 2000, like really started that boom um, that like they've sort of found the right way to balance like, this is the stuff you know from the comic books. We're trying to be true to the source material, but also trying to make it a little more real and like available to be understood. Like, yes, it's, it's cool. And it's scary that his mouth isn't moving because he's got this mask on. But I think if they were to make this movie today with the green goblin, they would probably like change his outfit a little bit because it's a little silly. Yeah, it's you're right. His head is a little large. Like, I don't think they would make it a little more ergonomic. If they made yeah. it today, I think. Um, I'm glad, Ross, that you brought up X-Men, though, because Ooh. Hugh Jackman actually almost made a cameo in a Spider-Man movie as Wolverine. What? I did and not know that. It was, like, all set. Like, he was going to be, like, in there, whether it was just going to be like, him, like, walking down the street or, like, actually part of, like, a fight scene or something. They were going to have him in there. And the only reason why he wasn't in there is because they couldn't locate the Wolverine costume. That rules. <laughs> that's that's the excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> that's amazing. That's the perfect excuse. Yeah. And what's so funny about that being the reason is that there was like multiple issues with costuming in this movie. One of the biggest ones being that four of the Spider-Man costumes, which are each $50,000. That's how much it costs to make his uh, costumes. Um Four of them went missing, like mid filming. I think they were. And it split. took them. They were. It took them over a year and a half to figure out where they went, and it was like two security guards that were like smuggling stuff out and stealing these costumes and selling them. <laughs> That's crazy. Yep. I was gonna say they're probably just hanging up in Tobey Maguire's closet. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, I forgot they're... they were there. <laughs> There's probably one in like a Planet Hollywood. Yeah. Now yeah, they have they, like oh, they yeah. have a bunch of them. But oh, really, four That's... of them went missing. So, and they only recovered three. So, one of them's still out there somewhere. It's it's there with all the art that was taken from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. It's all the same people. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Oh, goodness. Okay. So now we're gonna go scene by scene. And to be honest, this movie has like a lot of really good scenes. So we're mm-hmm. gonna. Talk, it's gonna probably take us a while. We're gonna talk about a lot of them. Um, and we're gonna start with the spider bite scene when yeah. Peter gets bit by the like spider that comes down from the ceiling. 
I think this scene captures what you were talking about earlier about like the getting the high school vibe. Mm-hmm. Being a school photographer or like the school paper photographer, like asking your crush to pose as like an excuse to it, like be is so true to the like seventeen year olds trying to flirt and not knowing what they're I doing. Loved it. It was that great. felt so <laughs> real to me. And as someone who wasn't cool when they were 17 and would like try to come up with excuses to talk to women, it was horrifying. <laughs> that was scarier than anything else because I saw myself in that moment, even though I was never a photographer and I hated it, but it was so good. Um, uh, I have another fun fact about <laughs> the spider bite <laughs> scene. Uh, they actually cast a real spider. And <laughs> what was their they- name? I don't know, but they had an entomologist bring in like a bunch of spiders so that Sam Raimi could look at all of them and like find like the perfect specimen. And then they hand painted the spider, the Blue actual spider. and red. Yep. So it that could be in the like film. animal abuse. I think it's okay. <laughs> Did they take the paint? I mean, sure, it's ethical paint or something. I don't know. I didn't dig too far into it. I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> that is so crazy. I feel like yeah. this movie was like right on the cusp where like they would never do that again. They would just use yeah. CGI, you know? Like, yeah, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. They were originally like going to looked, use what? I didn't feel like it looked that real. Like, I feel like I would have believed if you had told me that was CGI. I think parts of it were CGI'd, but they like used the, sp- the actual spider. Okay. And they were originally going to use a Black Widow, but obviously that poses some health problems. So, <laughs> risks. <laughs> I can foresee some problems there. Yeah. Painting a black widow, it'll be like all mad when they go to use it. Yeah, you can't mess with black widows. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was good how the spider came down. It was a little funny because it was like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Ha <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> oh, no, actually, there's only 14 spiders. And they're like, oh, they must be using one of them. Not worried about it at all. This spider we know nothing about is just out and about gone. The super spider. That's the thing that they like. They I didn't remember this from before when I was rewatching it. That they like. They're like this spider has this skill can jump from place to place, mm-hmm. and like this spider can shoot webs out of its wrists, and like this spider can climb walls, and this one is all three. And then it like that's the one that bites him. It's like oh my god, these are his abilities because we've explained it with spiders. Yeah, yeah. I did not remember that. It was very silly it's also yeah. funny like when you see him start putting two and two together that that's what's going on and he's like wait a minute i can climb up a wall let me just do that wait a minute i can jump really far let me just hop around buildings in new york wait a minute webs the just- webs are the webs are a choice i don't <laughs> <laughs> up up and away web yeah that's that's a great scene that is a very Shazam! <laughs> um, I like the uh, he like does like the horns up and he just like horns. rocks his several times. Um, I love all those elements out this movie where he's like such a goof. Yeah, like it makes it honestly makes the movie. I think that's why they were really into having him because I think he does mm-hmm. that really well and that comedy like works. Yeah, so. I agree. I know we're talking about this movie and not all of the Spider-Man movies, but do you guys have any strong feelings about them doing the web as like growing out of his wrist and not him having to create a web shooter? Because like every other Spider-Man in like the original comics, like one of the reasons that shows off because he's supposed to be like this brilliant kid. Like that's why he's in all of the fanciest schools, even though he is like poor, is that he's like super smart and he creates his own web shooters that are like watches and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And this one, he just kind of gets bit and, like, it comes out of his wrist. Um, Does that change anything to you guys? No. I think that was just Sam Raimi, like, taking some liberties. Yeah, Um, that didn't really bother me. I I kind of like it, actually. It kind of makes it more cool. And it's kind of weird because I feel like, um, like, in a lot of movies, I appreciate, like, the science. But I was kind of just, like, I just want to see him become Spider-Man. Like, honestly, like, I don't really care, like, how he gets there. Like, just shoot some webs. It's pretty cool. <laughs> we were just looking forward to that scene where he, like, realizes that he's hot now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then gets confident. And then... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I, did, you, did it bother you, Ross? 
No, I just, um, <laughs> I like didn't read that many comics as a kid. So like my introduction to Spider-Man was in this movie. Mm-hmm. And then I saw like other Spider-Man movies and I started reading up more. And it was just like a really strange, I remember when I like watched the Andrew Garfield movie for the first time and he had to like build a web shooter. I was like, what the hell? They made this character like way worse and weaker. And then I realized it was like, no, they just, that's like the actual, like the Stan Lee vision. He like has to mm-hmm. create his own stuff. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was a weird. Uh, it's if, like I felt emblematic of the fact that like he's goofier and not like the Tobey Maguire Spider Man doesn't seem as smart as the other Spider Man. I would agree with that. That makes sense. Yeah, but I also think he seems dumb in the way that's like all high schoolers are dumb, and I like that because I think that made him endearing. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Spider Man, we've done a lot of talking about. Tobey Maguire and him supposed to be like a teen and Spider-Man being the teen and all this stuff. And what's interesting is Spider-Man was actually the first teen superhero that wasn't an adult sidekick. And I think that's part of the reason why it was so successful is because yeah. all these kids were like, hey, that could be me. Like, I don't have to just like work under somebody like I could be cool, too, by myself. Yeah, I like I think it paved the way for comics to kind of like come back. Because I feel like at this time, like, comics were dying, and then they were, like, all of a sudden cool again, and then now you have this, like, huge Marvel franchise of today, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is, like, the first one that I remember being, like, wow, this is, like, superheroes are cool. (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely um, different. I was going to say, like, we mentioned that they came out uh, two years after the X-Men movie, but, like, as a kid when this movie came out, I remember everyone talking about and going to see this movie. I don't remember people, like, talking about the X-Men movies nearly as much. I went back and, like, rewatched those as an adult. I don't remember going to see those in theaters the way I did with the Spider-Man movies. Mm-hmm. That's true. This yeah. is, like, a family movie, so, like, everybody could watch and enjoy it. Yep. That probably did help. Um, okay, so we talked about the lunch scene. We probably don't need to talk about the fight with Flash Thompson, but I thought it was funny. Um so then next is climbing the wall, shooting the web for the first time. Amazing. We it was love cute. Yeah. yeah. I like I just like how like when he starts to climb the wall, like just the way he does it. It's so funny. Oh yeah, he looks so silly. <laughs> he looks so <laughs> silly. And like his he's legs like, get I'm all so funny. Cool. Very, <laughs> I was like, what is he wearing? He looks like he's like four years old in those I know. <laughs> His his yeah. outfit for the wrestling match is really something. Okay, the wrestling, the wrestling. I had forgotten about that plot of this movie. Like, yeah, just completely forgotten about it. That is the scene that I actually remember the most from when I watched this movie as a kid. Was that he had this like his like first attempt to go out as the wrestling. Well, but this is like when his jokes come out, and like that is like the personality of Spider Man of like you know, being in his Spider-Man outfit and then, like, teasing his opponent, basically. Like, that's Mm -hmm. one of my favorite things about him. And this is, like, the first time you see that. And it's, like, I I think it's done very well, like, as a starting point for that. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. Um, You know, I think 21 years later, I don't know how much uh, Did Your Husband Make It For You holds up as quality humor, but his jokes, like, it is good that he's, like, starting to get that well, confidence and like I actually thought it worked because it was kind of funny like that that guy like still today would be offended by that comment and then everyone else would think it's funny because it's like like funny that he is so offended by it kind of thing so I feel like it still kind of held up um but his costume was horrendous <laughs> it was bad yeah but it's you know really the great fortune of him that he just you know f- lucked out that uh wrestling mc bruce campbell was much better at naming him than uh he was the human spider i don't know if you guys so the evil dead movies that sam raimi was like most famous for what he started and he was made the first one for like zero dollars and cast like a 23 year old guy who's now become super famous and bruce campbell's in a lot of movies and he clearly was i don't know was doing a favor or as a bit and he was the wrestling mc was like the main character from all those evil dead movies which i thought was super cool um If you like came to this movie as a Sam Raimi fan and didn't know that much about it, which like I wasn't in 2002, I didn't know anything about it. But I, (laughs) I think those are the fun things when, um, 
if you like come to a movie because you like the director and you're like seeing them go into like their franchise mode or whatever it is that you're like, mm-hmm. hey, those are the guys I like. Like he's still got it. He's still the same director. Just another one on the list of like small parts in this movie that ended up being really big people. Mm-hmm. Which we did skip over. I said this earlier. Flash Thompson as Joe Manganiello, uh, who is now in like all the Magic Mike movies and everything like great. Just like everyone in that movie is just who has a tiny role with three lines went on to become famous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I is like- now married to Sofia Vergara. So shout out Flash Thompson. Really? <laughs> shout out. That's wild. He was what? not cute. <laughs> He's married to Sofia Vergara. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was not cute. He had like, it wasn't just the like, Early two thousand spiky hair. Like I just didn't find him. He's like a lug. He's like the yeah. lug guy. I guess maybe yeah. that was in in the early two thousands, but this just in Courtney is anti himbo, apparently. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so after the wrestling is when um Peter finds Uncle Ben mm-hmm. shot because he lets the um guy who's like mugging the man who gypped him from the wrestling money go and that guy ends up going and shooting Uncle Ben. And this is a very sad moment in the movie. Yeah. I will say, not to be rude, <laughs> the scene after Uncle when Uncle Ben dies is point one for Team Anti-Toby. He looks so weird <laughs> crying. <laughs> His crying face is so silly. <laughs> I don't remember that. What? Oh, it was all I could think about. He was like, he, like Ben is like, oh, like Peter, be well. And then he like closes his eyes and you see like the cops and people sort of going behind him. And Toby Maguire makes like the silliest face as he's crying in that moment. He gets like angry. And, I guess no, he's, like he's just, blank. it's just such like, an ugly cry. <laughs> his lips are moving in like eight different directions. Like it's. <laughs> oh, no. I was going to say that while I understood the sentiment of the scene, like I got I got what was going on. I understood what it was supposed to be. I thought the whole thing was incredibly cheesy, like every single part of it from the fake dying to the whole movie's like, cheesy. It was that scene particularly, though, was very like it kind of took away from the fact that it was supposed to be like a very serious, sad scene. Yeah. Yeah. I Yeah, it I mean it, it is. That was a pretty cheesy scene. But I do feel like it effectively like was the climax for Peter to be like, "Oh, now I need to like use this power be responsible or whatever. With great mm-hmm. power comes great responsibility." Like There you go. Don't <laughs> you forget <laughs> it. Yeah. Use this power and be responsible is basically the same quote. I, you know, that's <laughs> they. I think they put that on bumper stickers. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if y'all remember this, but right after this part is when they, I guess, flip to all the news interviews about Spider Man, like people seeing Spider Man in the town or in the city. <laughs> yeah (laughs) that's some elite new yorkers there i don't know i don't know if you guys did some research on how they got people Uh, if you told me that they truly just went out on the street and walked up to a random guy and were like hey we'll give you 50 bucks if you say some stuff about spider-man you'd be like hey man that's spider-man i like him he's up in my neighborhood it's perfect it is absolutely (laughs) elite that entire sequence could not be better I guess you would know as someone who's lived there felt very accurate. That's funny. <laughs> it's I- it's definitely hammed up, but it is it's it's true to the like, you know, this superhero showed up and, you know, some guy who's a taxi driver is like, I got a lot of thoughts about this spider fella. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yeah. It's the it's the whole uh TikTok thing about the what do you think about Joe Byron? Bing bong. <laughs> Bing bong. 20 years earlier. Yeah. I never understood that TikTok. <laughs> like ever. My it's, like it's it's silly people making silly noises. Yeah. Okay. It's the city of New York. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
True. True. Eight million silly people making silly noises. Well, it worked in this movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. So next, um, Peter goes and he tries to submit his um, photos at the newspaper to J.K. Simmons, yeah. the head of the Daily Bugle. Mm-hmm. We've established was great. Jameson. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I I thought fabulous through and through. Love that character. Um, and like I just love the fact too that Peter is his own photographer. Like I think that's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's his like source of income is trying to get pictures of Spider Man. Yeah, <laughs> he's like I, a get quick, get rich quick schemer. Yeah, like, the wrestling the photos. I like the ages um, though. The line where he's like, "Hey, like I was hoping I could get a job," and J. Jonah Jameson is like, "Job? No, no job. Freelance. It's the best thing for people like you or people your <laughs> age or whatever." <laughs> J. Jonah Jameson was ahead of the curve on hustle culture and grind. He was. He was. You're 18. You don't have a job. You need to be freelance. You need to be hustling. (laughs) Yeah. Gary V. owes part of his paycheck to J. Jonah Jameson. (laughs) Yeah. That's so funny. Okay. Next is the Unity Parade. I made a note that in the. Wait, hang on. Isn't the before the Unity Parade, isn't that the boardroom scene? Mm, yeah, probably. I probably skipped over it. Yeah. What's yeah, so special about the boardroom scene? scene? I thought it was boring. Uh, I just think it's... <laughs> I also thought it was boring. That's why I didn't write it down. Because it's got Willem Dafoe when he like starts to flip and he's like, you know how much I sacrificed? It's great! <laughs> I built this company. I also want to know how when you see that man's home, that he is like the creator of this company and they keep showing his apartment where he lives with Harry and it is the largest home in like possibly the entirety of New York. And he like runs this company and they're like, by the way, this other defense contractor is buying us out super easy. No problem. You're like, you're done. Like there's no way he's that wealthy. And then also can get his company bought out like that. That apartment is insane. Anyways, (laughs) unity parade. It's great. Sure. (laughs) I made a note that specifically in this scene is where you kind of see and like understand that MJ is a little bit of a clout chaser. Oh, yeah. Of course and she's she is. Like, kind of because she's like, I want to be an actress. Like, I'm going to be in Hollywood, like blah, blah, blah. And she's like, start, you're, you start to understand why she's with the guys she's with. You also start to understand that Harry is a dick. Like, he literally was like, why aren't you wearing the black dress? Like, my dad wants you to wear the black dress. I was like, MJ, get the fuck out. Like, what <laughs> are you doing, girl? Yeah. It's pretty Rude. bad. Rude. Um. Okay. So then there's the fight scene and the uh, balcony breaks off and mm-hmm. Peter flies away with MJ. I like the part where he bounces on the balloons in order to get up there. Yeah, <laughs> that's my big takeaway from the Unity Day scene. I thought that was kind of it funny. Yeah, think of I used to play the Spider-Man video game, not like the new one that just came out, but like the original one for PlayStation Two, like mm-hmm. right after this movie came out. And I feel like that's like a part of that movie. Like it makes me think of like Mario Kart too, like when they bounce on the balloons, <laughs> mm-hmm. like very video game esque. It worked very well in the game. Yeah. yeah. Also, did you guys notice? Um, in the Unity Day scene, the like thing that I, the Willem Dafoe when he's the Green Goblin when he like is about to kill the Oscorp board people, he was like, "You're trying to take my company away from me," and then he kills them. And it's like you gotta hope that those people died because you just outed yourself as the Green Goblin. And then I guess everyone died and no one knew. Like it, it just really seemed, I don't know. It seemed like a poor choice for him if he's trying to keep his secret identity. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how um, MJ didn't hear any of this. And also, MJ doesn't get vaporized by the vapor bomb or whatever. Oh my god, those people just turned into skeletons. I forgot yeah. that. <laughs> that was nuts. <laughs> Crazy. I remember seeing that and just being like, oh. <laughs> Harry and MJ are like right there, but his yeah. little magic bomb thing only gets those five people. <laughs> Is that? Okay, he has that technology and he's losing a weapons contract? Get out of here. 
You know how much money the U.S. government would pay for that? (laughs) Also, I love, like, how cartoony the skeletons were. (laughs) They're so silly. Like, somebody drew them on a piece of paper and, like, cut them out. They are very literally spooky, scary skeletons. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I liked them. It worked very well. I feel like if you were a kid, like, you would actually think that was kind of scary. You'd be like, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. They turned to skeletons. Yeah. Um, okay, so after Peter flies off with MJ and before we get to see them like together, and we'll talk about that, but you see Willem Dafoe like talking with his alter ego at this point. Mm-hmm. And we've mentioned it a little bit, but I just have to give a moment for him because his acting is so good in this mm-hmm. moment. Like just incredible. Like he like takes the cake of like acting in this movie. Oh, without question. I think, I mean, I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about all the characters, like, I think he's just awesome. And I think that the, this scene when he like, is just talking to himself, and it's as exciting or entrancing, if not more so than most of the scenes where there's two people talking. to him. And you realize that like, when they're filming this, he has to like, turn it on to mm-hmm. talk to like, there's no one there. Like there's, you know, I don't know, some yeah. of these movies where like, if you're talking to someone else, they're like, or the, someone's talking to like a dinosaur CGI, they'll often like be acting with like a tennis ball. And that's what they have to pretend mm-hmm. like they're talking to. He's, he's, he's insane. Oh, I love Willem Dafoe. Yeah. He, I, I like made a note about this saying like that character would have been so difficult to portray simply because, and that scene where he's like in the mirror and you see Willem Dafoe and you see him in the mirror, that is one take. Like he is literally like switching between those two characters by himself just so impressive it's crazy Mm -hmm. i like that scene is entrancing like rossi you said it pretty well like it's just as entertaining as like any other scene with multiple actors in it like he he can just have a conversation with himself it's pretty cool Mm -hmm. okay so now my favorite scene of the movie and probably like the most iconic scene of the franchise if we're being perfectly mm-hmm. honest um the upside down kiss yes yes <laughs> everything about this scene works very well for me <laughs> the kiss seems a little uncomfortable it's so romantic i love the moment they're in the rain i was just like watching it as i was happening and i was like i feel like if i was trying like if i was actually kissing someone like this we'd walk away from it being like no nah, it didn't really work like, you know, we tried it, but, like, it looked like they were just, like, the, um, you know, it, podcasting as a visual medium. Like, they're just, like, <laughs> on each other's mouths really strangely. <laughs> but it works. It did work. Toby Maguire yeah. has big lips. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and, like, um, Kirsten Dunst is, like, her top is completely see-through in the rain. Yes. Like, completely. I made a note about how they sexualize every female character in this movie. Yes. Every female character. 2002 yes. was a wild time. <laughs> it was. It's, it's, it was not that long ago. We've, that's, we've made a lot of progress in the last, like, six years at most. Mm-hmm. So what's so wild to me is that – so Sam Raimi, this upside-down kissing scene, very icon- iconic. Um, but Sam Raimi actually made a scrapbook – of all of the famous kissing scenes to give to Kirsten Dunst to inspire her for that scene. Wow. Do you yeah. know what was in the uh, scrapbook? Not a clue. But it did happen. He gave her a scrapbook and he like was like proud of it. He was like, yeah, I gave her a scrapbook. It was great. She did a great job because of the scrapbook. <laughs> I feel like you've got to be a little nutty to like... <laughs> movie like this so like that doesn't surprise me that much but that's a lot of pressure and also goes to the like comment of like sexualizing all the women like mm-hmm. yeah like <laughs> give the scrapbook to toby mcguire yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got no direction they were like just stand there kirsten dunce will do it all <laughs> he had to hang upside down he really oh, did have to let her do it all because she took off the <laughs> mask. She did all the kissing. Like, he just got to lay there. Hang there, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Just riding off the hard work of women, men profiting. This is, you know, this is what it is. Classic. Not wrong. I also Society. like, like, when there were, like, the four men around MJ and, like, just the way, like, Peter took them all out with the web. 
I think it works. He's really like good. winding them up on the street <laughs> sign. <laughs> Funny. Fave scene. And the rain. I feel like everything about that scene was like so dramatic. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And the like, um, the rain that picks up out of nowhere. Like they're having a conversation. She turns the corner and all of a sudden it's the hardest rain New York City has ever seen. Like they were in sunlight 30 seconds ago. Like, <laughs> very comic book esque. I think. Yeah. Fair. Um, okay, so next is the fire scene, and we already talked about it. But the one thing we didn't talk about it is like that one little part where there's like the Matrix like special effects where he like dodges all those like <laughs> what do you call them? What do you like call those katanas? little like Yeah, katanas. Is that the right word? I don't know. The, the discs. The little, little weapon. They were Beyblades. I don't know. Bay- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, true. Green Goblin was was hucking his Beyblades at him, and you know we just <laughs> he he dodged him. It was super impressive. Okay, the cable car scene. Yeah, no thoughts. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was it was the scene. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have any strong thoughts. If if you like. <laughs> They probably like toned it down because of like the 9-11 thing. They probably were trying to make it like a little chill. But I don't um, know. My my biggest thing is I've never understood why someone would take the gondola like cable car thing to Roosevelt Island. There's a subway. Just take that. (laughs) Yeah, true. I also think MJ should have died in that scene. Like, you know, when she fell kind of like what? Courtney. No, not like not like I wanted her to die. Oh, like when she like catches onto the side of the thing. Yeah, like that. All like, of a sudden, has superhuman strength. Oh yeah, that's 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 a super lucky grab that was yeah. very unrealistic from the non superhero. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that upside down kiss gave her like a little bit of spider power, so she was able to grab oh. onto the side. Interesting side plot. I do love in superhero movies when there's like a random side character who's like, don't worry, Spider-Man, I'm going to help you out. And like the fairy guy who is like, I'm coming to save the people, (laughs) Spider-Man. We're coming. He's going to make it. You just got to hold on a little longer. (laughs) And the guys, all the people like up on top of the bridge that are just like chucking stuff at the Green Goblin, like like that was actually going to do something. I guess it did in the movie, but like. Boo, tomato, tomato, tomato. <laughs> yeah. Yorkers are so weird. I would have been running away so fast. I would not have been there to help Spider-Man. Sorry. Like, you got this, sir. Like, I'm out. <laughs> I know I, I know where I stand. I'm not MJ, so bye. <laughs> well, now I know if I ever develop superpowers, not to call Courtney to help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <And> it's myself. <laughs> um, okay. And then... The Green Goblin gets defeated by himself. Classic. Even if Spider-Man that... hadn't moved, he would have died. So, True. Well, I assume if it once it stabs Spider-Man, it would have stopped, I guess. No, you're right. That's that's uh that's on him. But I think it just goes <laughs> to show like how insane he was at that point. Like he was crazy. Like full on crazy, lost his mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that was like a pretty was like happen. good and spooky setting for like a final fight. Like the kind of like yeah, it, was it was like a ruins. church graveyard ruins thing. Mm-hmm. Um, How did they find that? Like where did they, they probably build it? It was probably a yeah. Set they might have just somewhere. made it. I don't know. I feel like whenever they do a New York movie, they always like find a way to like become in an unpopulated abandoned place. And I'm like, are there really that many like abandoned? rubble no (laughs) because it doesn't feel not in new york it's probably outside of new york somewhere yeah um i will say in that moment there is a cool scene which is like very much uh sam raimi like trying to be a horror director when the wall falls on him and it's like oh no and then like you just see like the hand shoot up from outside of the bricks Mm -hmm. it very much looks like like a zombie coming out of the ground and like a you know, sci-fi movie or something like that. I not sci-fi horror movie. Like there's just like the skeleton hand. It's like, oh, I just saw that and I was like, that's a horror director. Something's that man knows happen. exactly what he wants. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. And then the last scene is 
MJ confessing her love for Peter Parker. Yeah. And he denies her. And I was very sad. <laughs> I thought the like voiceover at the very end of it really doesn't work. <laughs> I don't I know I'm like anti voiceover in general, but like there's like the whole thing and he like he like says goodbye to her and you you see this like am- like amazing emotional moment that's like not ex- all expressed on his face because he doesn't know how to express emotion. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like I guess I had to say goodbye and now go off to be the like hero that New York needs me to be because I am Spider Man or whatever it is. Yeah. And it just like, like it really felt I? like it took the emotional weight out of this. Like if you want to put like it's this climax of like he's choosing, you know, who he is over the girl who he's chased for his entire life. Like you got that from that scene. Like you understood what it was and then he like turned away and then you just hear hit Toby Maguire's voice say, This is why I did this. I didn't yeah. like that. <laughs> it was a little unnecessary. I also thought like the whole scene was pretty forced. Like MJ yeah. telling Peter Parker that she's in love with him felt very like rehearsed. And like maybe yeah. that was the point. Maybe she like had to like build up to it, but like it was a little bit unrealistic. It was like she spent yeah. the whole movie like being conflicted between Harry and Spider-Man and then all of a sudden she was in love with Peter Parker. Like, yeah, that's also something I don't like in movies when there's like someone who's like finally confessing their feelings for someone like that. And mm-hmm. they just jump out. Right. She's like, you know what? I broke up with Harry because I'm desperately overwhelmingly in love with you, Peter. It's like you well, like Peter. You want to go on some dates and you've known him for a while. But like <laughs> this happens in all the movies. We're like, oh, the will they won't they? And they're like, I'm actually like overwhelmingly in love with you and we're gonna get married it's like nah people don't do that that's hang on relax like maybe they do and we're just not like friends no they don't that's not real no (laughs) um i will point out too that in all of the spider-man movies like all of the like different variations of spider-man the main couple so spider-man and mj or spider-man and uh gwen stacy yeah gwen stacy they've all dated in real life Oh, yeah, you're right. So Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst dated during this movie. How could they Tom not? Tom Holland and Zendaya, Zendaya and who's the Andrew Garfield one? and Emma Stone. Yep. They mm-hmm. dated. All of them. Huh. That's true. Maybe that upside down kiss is more, rant- more romantic than I realized. Yeah. You should start doing it. I mean, <laughs> you do <didn't> move. <laughs> Let me get some, some wires and harnesses so I can start hanging upside down more often. <laughs> I will I'm say I my question you less attractive if you weren't like actually using spider webs. So Yeah, that's like the man is just like hanging out there. That's why she has to do all that work because he doesn't have like the super spider abilities. Tobey Maguire is in like a really uncomfortable harness, like holding on for dear life, I'm sure, in that moment. Like <laughs> Just hanging on by his feet. <laughs> yeah, someone's like holding on to his feet and he's like, please don't drop me, key grip number two. Like <laughs> You can argue that his acting is incredible then because he's <laughs> straight. Face. He's not acting. She's doing all the work. We already discussed this. <laughs> yeah. True. Okay. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our discussion. Ross, is there mm-hmm. anything or Elizabeth, is there anything that we like didn't get to talk about before we get into the ratings? I have one very important question. Okay. Why are Harry and Peter friends? I was wondering that as because well. Because he's mean. I think they're supposed to be like, Harry goes to the fancy private schools because he's rich. And Peter goes to the fancy private schools because he's, he's like smart. so smart that he gets in on scholarships and stuff like that. But then... They're like, oh, Harry got kicked out of, like, every single private school, so he has to go to this public school that he's only, like, it seems to imply he's only been there, like, a week before graduation. I don't, Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't feel like he's been there that long. And then the two of them are like, we've known each other since we were in, like, second grade. Except Harry lives in a house out in Queens, and Peter, or no, Peter lives in a house out in Queens, and Harry lives in some enormous penthouse in Manhattan. When did they get to know each other? So I think the point there is that Harry wants to be Peter. Like Peter yeah. is everything that his dad wants Harry to be. And Harry is 
like latching on to him because he so desperately wants to be that. I think that's the whole point. That's why he dates MJ. That's why he like studies the way he does and all these other things because he wants to be Peter Parker because he okay. so desperately wants his dad's approval. The loft I- apartment they have, the two of them is pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. That is, cool. that is cool. So I had a friend like this in high school who like – I was friends with her first, but then like I probably wouldn't have kept being friends with her because we were kind of like different, but I really liked her family and they had tacos <laughs> very often and I would go over there for taco nights and like kept and they would let me tutor her younger sister so I'd made money and like I just kept being friends with her because I really like liked the perks and I feel like Peter Parker is kind of like the same like he gets like the perks of being like the golden child with Mr. Oz born you know yeah yeah i mean look what's the point of friendship without perks right court <laughs> i'm here for it if it's got a perk <laughs> why not okay yeah. <laughs> just um, <a> dad <laughs> the only thing i have to say that we haven't talked about yet and <laughs> this is gonna tell a little bit about how my rating's gonna go but yeah. i clocked more than 10 minutes of credits in this movie three and a half minutes at the beginning and over seven minutes at the end just I actually think the opening there. credits is really cool. I like the opening credits too. I think it's it very well done. So long. I think it is the best usage of CGI in the whole movie. Yeah, I think it's iconic. <laughs> that because so when it's crazy. it is iconic, I think it does a good job. And they clearly spent too much money on that and not enough money to make it really look like he was like flipping through buildings. Because there's moments like when he's first learning to jump like from roof to roof, and he and it's like he'll like jump off a building, and I'm like, oh nope, that's not that's green screen. You guys, spend a couple extra bucks. Come on. <laughs> I liked it. I remember watching it as a kid and being like, "This, we're getting ready to watch Spider Man. Like, this is the opening <laughs> credits." So, but I'm sorry, sorry the credits were too long, Elizabeth. They were very long. But Ross, we get to hear your rating first. And as a reminder, we use Letterbox, so zero to five stars, and you can do like half star increments. So I logged this movie on Letterbox last night when I when I watched it, and I made sure not to put the, my rating on there because I didn't want you guys to know in advance. Mm-hmm. I think this is a three star movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it is just like right down the middle of that. There's plenty of fun. I'd be willing to go three and a half because there's Here. a lot. There's a lot to be said for like the fun to it. I think the villain is great. Um, I just like I can't get behind Toby as my leading man, and that takes like a whole point off the top. If the movie's all on his shoulders, it takes at least a point off the top, and then you know this is this is rude of me in 2023 to look back at a 2002 movie and be like the CGI is not good enough, but it loses another half point to a point for that. That's okay. fair. How does um like who is your fave Spider Man if it's not Toby Maguire? This may be cheating. I do think the best Spider-Man is Shameik Moore as Miles Morales in Into the Spider-Verse. I do love that his character. But it is cheating because he's not a real human. Like, he's an animated character. So they could make him whatever they want him to be. I do... Oof. <laughs> I would probably go Holland Garfield Maguire if we're talking live-action spider man Okay, Garfield is a hundred percent. He was the worst. So bad. The worst. So bad. That whole series with Emma Stone. The movies are worse. The movies are worse. He is a better (laughs) Spider-Man than Tobey Maguire. No, if he was, they would have done better. That's. I think it's a. uh, All right. I think people call them the Tom Holland movies, the Andrew Garfield movies, and the Sam Raimi movies for a reason. They do not call them the same Rami movies. They call them the Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Okay, well, the people I talk to call them the same <laughs> Rami movies. I think it's similar to the Batman saying. movies. Is that like there's the Michael Keaton Batman movies and there's the Nolan trilogy. Because Christian I- Bale is great, but those movies are good because Christopher Nolan made them great. No, I, I call them the, like by the actor, Christian Bale. <laughs> That's just how I roll. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, Liz, your rating. Okay, I give this a three star. Very solid three stars. Okay. It was better than average. That's why it didn't get a two and a half. Better than average. But 
I like caught myself a lot of times during this movie being like, oh my God, it's still going. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just, just oh. <laughs> Well, on a little seven bit. whole minutes of credits at the end like <laughs> who can fucking handle that that's honestly not like if you watch a marvel movie today the credits are three if times you watch any movie today the credits are 10 minutes long <laughs> i don't know what you're i don't know what that takes just... like what are you just gonna like cut the like assistant video editor be like no no you don't get to be in the credits we you don't do, like <laughs> credits that's like after the movie's over you know that right <laughs> Yeah, but the opening credits were just really long. Like, I feel like they're not long like that anymore. And I just didn't like the opening credits. It wasn't about the credits. My rating is not about the credits. <laughs> okay. I noticed the credits because of I the have a qualm. Like- You're going to notice this in my rating. I didn't like the credits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because that's what I was paying attention to and not the actual movie. <laughs> so. Tough look. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I gave this movie four stars. Okay. And the reason I think I rated it so high, and because I feel like as I was watching it, I recognized that if I was watching this for the first time at mm-hmm. this viewing, I probably wouldn't have liked it as much because it definitely has some elements of like bad acting and like the CGI is a little bad at parts. And the story is like a little bit like over dramatic and like cheesy. But I feel like that's part of the reason that I like really liked it because it like captured the essence of like a comic book. And I I just have always liked that element of it. And I also think there's an element of nostalgia to this movie too because it was – I remember watching it like the year it came out and just loving this movie. And I've always loved this movie. And I think Tobey Maguire is by far the best Spider-Man um he's like the original so how could you deviate from him you know i think i like we obviously we all watch this movie as kids courtney this is is this like a foundational childhood movie for you that you've like watched like once a year for the last 20 years or so yeah this is like my she has it on dvd i do this is one of two movies i own on dvd um <laughs> what's the second inception <laughs> Kind of random. I, I what a wild pairing of movies. <laughs> um. Okay, but we gotta get you some more DVDs. <laughs> I remember like, the day that my dad came home with this movie, and he's like, "This new movie, y'all, we have to watch it." And like, we all watch it as a family, and like, he like made the lights go down low, and it was like dark, and I was just like, like I remember that, and like I was so young, right? Like I was six years old, and like I must maybe I was seven maybe he waited until after it came out of the um what's it called theaters but i don't know it is a foundational movie for me i really really like it that's why it's in this season of movies to begin with no i i also have not as specific a memory but i like definitely remember going to see it when it first came out um Mm -hmm. and like remembering it and going to see all three movies um and i remember liking them a lot because i remember like I was probably 10 walking out of Spider-Man three being like, so disappointed that this like franchise I thought was great was like, not as good. Um, So I have it, but it's it's not one that has stuck with me as much throughout my life. So I was, I was glad to get the chance to rewatch it because I don't think I'd seen this movie in in several years. Um, But I definitely think that like, we all have a few movies that kind of like stick with us from childhood. Mm -hmm. That is definitely more of a nostalgia play and like, will play into your, memories of it like there's definitely movies that i will like are not good that i would rate five stars because i like (laughs) thought they were amazing and i refuse to give up on them (laughs) the italian job that movie rules the italian job is such a good movie (laughs) i (laughs) okay you can be mad at me all right let's let's close this out courtney (laughs) all right ross thank you so much for joining the episode you were absolutely fabulous the joke i agree (laughs) um we couldn't thank you enough for joining thanks for having me guys this was a lot of fun it was fun okay um so now we're going to talk about our season one merch giveaway Mm -hmm. so me and liz are running some merch giveaways um we're not wearing any of the merch in this episode unfortunately but we've got lots of fun stuff so go to our instagram for full details on how to enter the giveaway and you can find us 
on all of our socials, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Be Critics Podcast. Yes. And thank you so much for checking us out. Um, we'd appreciate if you could leave us a rating and review. And if you're loving what we're doing here, be sure to subscribe and follow. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And last, check out our website, becritics.com, or find all these links on our link tree in the episode show notes. All right. All right. Thanks for watching, listening, all the things. Bye, guys. Bye.